Hi, my name is Kristen Barr and I'm the Coordinator of Instructional Technology and Personalized Learning for WJCC Schools. I'd like to thank Dr. Highland for inviting me to speak with you today about our division issued devices and the policies and procedures that the technology department has in place for students and staff while using our devices. Part of my responsibilities are to work with staff at each school to most effectively integrate technology into their classrooms and to help students responsibly use their devices for learning. So I'm excited to share some of this with you all today. WJCC is now a one-to-one -one school division pre-K through 12, which is really exciting. In 2019, we had developed a plan to implement one-to-one -one in our schools over a number of years, but as we've seen, COVID has really sped that up. Student devices and use for educational work provides the opportunity for students to have greater access to online information, tools, and programs at every grade. This year, for the most part, devices were issued in the first weeks of school at schools during the school day. Students brought their device loan agreement to distribution and were issued a device, charger, and case or bag. For this school year, our pre-K and kindergarten students are learning with Android tablets, and our first and second graders have switched to Chromebooks. This is a change from the 2020-21 school year when our first and second graders were using Android tablets. The decision to make that change was the result of feedback from teachers and other WJCC staff members who felt that the tablets weren't meeting the needs of our first and second graders and that a Chromebook would be more appropriate for meaningful learning. So that request was honored and our first and second graders this year are using Chromebooks. Our students in third through 12th grade are using Windows laptops. To support the use of all of these devices in each school, we do have a tech support kiosk available daily at every school. Our IT technicians are available to troubleshoot, fix, or when needed, replace WJCC issued devices. These are technicians who work on the hardware. So in most cases, if a student needs to visit the kiosk because they have an issue with their keyboard or their mouse, because their screen is broken or something else is happening with their device and they need someone to help troubleshoot and fix it, they ask their teacher for permission to visit the kiosk during the designated time Usually they'll let their teacher know what the issue is so that he or she can try to troubleshoot and fix it possibly in the classroom. But then the teacher should allow the student to visit the kiosk as long as it does not interfere with class instruction. So they're not gonna be allowed to go to kiosk during a test or a quiz, but the kiosk is available typically for an hour to an hour and a half at each school. So usually sometime during that period, the student is able to go to the kiosk to have their device looked at. For login or software issues, schools have a technology integration coach who works with teachers and students to resolve these types of issues. WJCC has an acceptable use policy or AUP, which is a document that state and federal agencies require that we have in place to provide students and staff guidelines for appropriate use of any device that connects to our internet. This isn't new with our one-to-one -one initiative. This was required long before because we've had devices that connect to the internet in our schools for many, many years. Labs in the media center, or computer labs, laptop carts, things of that nature. So our acceptable use policy has been in place for many years. The AUP is a document that outlines the appropriate use of the internet, electronic devices, and other technology. 
It's signed whenever a student joins a new school community. So typically that's kindergarten, sixth grade, and ninth grade. But anytime we have a new student or a student who transfers between schools, they would sign a new AUP. This is required to use any WJCC internet connected device, not only the one-to-ones. The one-to-one -one program does require a, an additional document to be signed called the Student Device Loan Agreement. And we'll talk about aspects of those here in the next few minutes. The AUP is a multi-page document that includes many, many aspects of using our devices and our networks. Here are some of the highlights of that document. The WJCC network and devices are provided for educational use only to support teaching and learning. Because of this, WJCC devices should only be used by the student or staff member for educational purposes. If you have multiple WJCC students in your home, they should each have and use their own assigned device and personal use should be limited. Use by other individuals within the home should be limited or really not used at all. The use of our devices and network is a privilege. As such, that privilege could be revoked for a period of time based on different circumstances or consequences due to behavior or choices made by the student. Our WJCC devices are loaned to our students, which means that they remain property of WJCC. So because of that, we can't alter the device in any way. Students should not add personal software of any type to the device. And the devices and use of the devices are monitored. Because of this, if there is an issue or if one of our engineers sees something that requires Further investigation, our WJCC devices may be requested to be reviewed at any time. The student device loan agreement, which was signed when a device was issued to your student, has many expectations for the student's behavior and choices with the device. So students should know where their device is at all times. This is their responsibility and they should not loan their device or charger to other individuals because again, ultimately, they're responsible for the device that was issued to them at the beginning of the year. The devices should not be altered in any way and no aspects of the device should be removed. That includes the labels and serial numbers that are on the bottom of the device for our inventory system. The devices should be used with only authorized educational programs installed by WJCC staff. This one is very important. Students are not to download or install or play games, videos, music, or pictures unless they're directly related to classroom instructions. Students are not able to install software downloaded from the internet. However, Students may misuse files downloaded from a USB or thumb drive. So if you see your student playing a game or other software that you think may not be educational and maybe should not be on their computer, it's a good opportunity to ask them what they're playing, what they're doing, and what class it's for. And if it's not supposed to be on there, to talk to them about these expectations, the documents that they've signed, and whether or not they should have those files on their computer. Students do have access to Microsoft 365, which includes a cloud-based storage. So all of their files could be saved directly to the cloud without needing a USB drive. Um, but anything that is saved from a USB drive should be directly related to their classes or school related documents. Students should also refrain from personalizing their device with stickers, decals, markers, paint, glue, other substances. We've seen a lot of these things over the years, 
but these devices are loaned for only a year and each summer they are taken to a vendor locally to be refreshed, refurbished, and reconditioned. So adding these devices, sorry, these stickers and decals make that process um, much more time intensive. So again, if there is damage to a device, if there is something that um, you're not sure of that you're seeing on the device, students can see their technician at their kiosk on a daily basis and the IT team can diagnose and fix issues or swap devices. We do have warranty for our devices, so damage that is due to an accidental, day-to-day, -day, typical use is typically covered by our warranty and those repairs are made without any cost to our families. However, issues caused by neglect or intentional action may be invoiced. It's similar to the warranty you may have for your cell phone. Many things are included with repair or replacement of that device, but certain things, such as water damage, aren't. It's the same type of procedure with our warranty for our laptops. For lost chargers, um, a replacement fee is invoiced. They can receive the replacement charger at kiosk, but a fee will be invoiced to the family. If a charger is damaged and no longer usable, that damaged charger should be brought to the kiosk and that is covered under warranty and an invoice would not be sent. As we're on the subject of the more technical side of things, we'll briefly talk about our WJCC security and protections. This admittedly is not my wheelhouse. I am a member of our instructional technology team, so I really work with our school-based staff on implementing technology in the classroom and on, with some of our software programs used for education. But um, we do have a number of security and protection processes in place for use with our devices. All of our devices are connected to a VPN or virtual private network. You may have seen the words global protect on your child's device and this is our VPN. It's a tool on WJCC computers that keeps the device on our network even when it's used at home or other off-site locations. This allows us to manage what can be accessed on the device for instructional reasons because it brings all of the internet traffic back through our WJCC firewall and filtering protocols. We often get questions about what is or isn't allowed on our network. And so briefly, I'll touch on some of those. YouTube is allowed because it really is a wonderful instructional resource. There are very appropriate instructional videos housed on YouTube. In fact, many educational sites such as the History Channel, for example, use YouTube for their primary video storage. They're not hosting their own videos on their own servers any longer, but rather freeing up some of their server space by hosting their videos on YouTube. So because of this, we can't block YouTube entirely. It's being used in our classroom and it's being used appropriately. We do have the education filter provided by Google activated on YouTube searches. So this filters the YouTube videos and restricts videos that based on their algorithms are not appropriate for school age children. We don't control this filter. We can't control what they approve or do not approve for educational purposes, but we can report URLs and videos that we feel are unacceptable millions of YouTube videos are uploaded every day. And so often things may get missed. And if there is something that you feel is inappropriate, let us know so that we can take action to see if we can 
have that blocked, it can be reviewed. WJCC does not allow gaming on our devices. If students are using their device for playing games that aren't related to instruction or their classes, then this is an unapproved use of their device. We do have Microsoft's Minecraft Education Edition installed on computers or available to be installed on computers because it is an educational tool that many teachers are using in their classroom. If your student is using this game in particular when at home for things other than their school lessons, it would be a great opportunity to talk to them about the right and the wrong time to use certain tools and their ability to make choices about appropriate use for that particular device and that particular software program. We do not allow chat programs for student use. So if your student is using a chat program, then they're using an unapproved resource. Our firewall and filters block as many of those as we are aware of and that the, the algorithms identify as chat programs. But again, millions of websites are added to every day and um, sometimes getting those um, categorized in the right way takes a little bit of time. So again, if your student is using a chat program, they should not be. Um, you can report what program is being allowed so that we can take a look at um, at what our firewall and filter is catching. So we appreciate your partnership in this effort because it is a huge undertaking and it takes all of us to keep our children safe and using the appropriate resources online. And so this is a great time to talk a little bit about internet safety and digital citizenship. This is a large topic and it requires the attention of everyone in our community. At WJCC, we try to be proactive in teaching about digital citizenship and internet safety. So your help in reinforcing these topics at home is greatly appreciated and hugely beneficial. So let's start with what does digital citizenship mean? Digital citizenship refers to the responsible use of technology by anyone who uses computers, the internet, and digital devices. It includes topics like online safety, cybersecurity, digital responsibility, and digital literacy. You may have heard the term digital footprint and what that means. And essentially, it's a term used for the digital data and files that are left behind by someone's internet use. Think of footprints on the beach as you're walking. It's what's left behind. So we encourage students to think about and be careful about what they share, where they share it, and with whom. They need to be smart about sites that they visit, links that they click on while they're navigating the internet or checking their email, and what emails even open. So we encourage our staff and our students to be themselves online, to share their opinions respectfully and responsibly, and to be their best self, to put their best foot forward, just like we encourage them to do when they're in person. We do have guidelines to help them do just that. And we call this netiquette. It's a term used to describe the proper and polite way to interact with people online. The images here that you see are examples of posters that may be posted in classrooms around the division or in digital classrooms on Canvas or in the LMS pages on View. But as a general rule, if a behavior is not acceptable face-to-face, -face, then it's not acceptable online either. So we try to reinforce on a daily basis, any time that students use their devices, these certain aspects to treat others how you want to be treated, 
to be cautious when using abbreviation, slang, sarcasm, because it can be misinterpreted or misunderstood. When someone's reading something, they can't see your facial expressions or body language that may indicate the meaning or tone behind that particular sentence or message. So we teach students that, but if you could help reinforce that at home, it would really go a long way for them knowing and using these netiquette guidelines. These guidelines come into play a lot when we consider email and social media. Elementary students do not have an active WJCC email address. You may see what looks like an email address for purposes of logging into other programs, but elementary students cannot receive or send email from their WJCC account. Middle school students do have an active email address, but it's for internal communication only. So they're only allowed to email members of the WJCC community. They can't receive or send emails to outside email addresses. And high school students do have full active email with permissions to send and receive emails from outside of our division. This is really important for their college and career applications. So we do have the opportunity for students to have their email. Email is through our system though and is monitored and can be reviewed if an administrator requests that for disciplinary purposes. And then our social media sites are blocked or view only. So students should not be able to do too much in terms of social media on their school issued devices. We have made some of the social media sites view only because of instructional requests for examples of current events or art and things of that nature. So you may see view only as aspects of certain social media. And these things change too. Just recently we had a popular social media site change their functionality on the web versus their app. So we adjust based on that as well. And it was because of one of our family members, a parent in our community, that we were able to really see how that particular program had changed. So we do rely a lot on um, everyone's help in keeping everyone safe and focused on using their device for school purposes, for educational purposes. And we'll briefly talk about cyberbullying. This is a serious and real issue that many of our students may be concerned about. Cyberbullying is the use of digital communication tools to repeatedly make another person feel angry, sad, or scared. Examples of cyberbullying include, but aren't limited to, making repeated social media posts that are intimidating, threatening, or inappropriate sending emails that contain the same type of information. Even prank calls can be considered bullying if they're repeated and making the other person um, feel angry, sad, or scared. So we do have resources to help you speak with your child regarding the appropriate behavior online. We always like to focus on our expectations rather than what we shouldn't do. Um, Common Sense Media has great resources for families. So does On Guard Online, which is far, part of the Federal Trade Commission's webpage, and Connect Safely. So um, feel free to explore those resources yourself and engage with your student. Um, when appropriate with some of these topics. When I was teaching the classroom, I always had this poster up and it says, before you post, think, is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring, necessary, or kind? And I would just draw my students' attention to it every now and again when we would bring our computers out because it is important to remind them about netiquette, digital citizenship, 
and their responsibility to make our classroom community, whether it's in person or online, a safe and comfortable place for all of our students. One thing that we've thought a lot about in the last couple of years in particular are screen time recommendations. Because our students now do have a division issued device, what is the appropriate amount of time to spend on them from a health standpoint? And the VDOE has provided some guidance for students and the use of devices. They say, as the use of digital devices in the educational setting continues to rise, it is paramount to consider best practices related to screen or online time and the appropriate use of breaks from technological devices. So their recommendations are for students ages two through five, so pre-K and kindergarten, they should have at most one hour of screen time per day. And this is not necessarily one continuous hour, but cumulatively about one hour per day. For students aged six through 12, two to three hours per day, and ages 13 and older, three to four hours per day. Again, not continuous, and different students in different circumstances may or may not be able to comply with this entirely. Of course, we have students who are in our virtual academies who may spend more time on this, but then it's important to remember to take breaks. Take breaks from the screen every 20 to 30 minutes and rest your eyes for 15 minutes for every two hours of screen time. In general, there's a 20-20-20 rule that we like to recommend. Every 20 minutes on a screen, students should look at an object that's at least 20 feet away for 20 seconds. So this just helps rest their eyes and refocus All of these can help address concerns related to eye health, good sleep hygiene, and physical considerations. There is an importance to finding a balance between healthy screen and online time and other activities. Many of our teachers do this intentionally with how they plan their virtual lessons. And finally, I just wanted to share a few at-home management tips that may help you help your student manage their educational device. So first, build a schedule. Have a particular time where your student is working on their online schoolwork and make sure to schedule breaks, as we just mentioned, so that they consider their eye health, good sleep hygiene, and things of that nature. Keep and use devices in a shared space. Again, these devices should be used for educational purposes only. So if students are doing their assignments at a desk that's in a shared space, at the dining room table, or if they are in their bedroom having their door open, things of that nature can help you just monitor what they're doing and how they're using their device. I recommend creating a charging space where all devices are left for overnight charging and so that you know where to find them easily. The next day, mornings can be rushed and busy. And so if you have a routine that includes where devices are so that they're ready to be packed up and charged so they can be used in school the next day, we find it very helpful. Create and regularly use your VIEW, Canvas, and Remind accounts. So VIEW is our student information system and that's where you'll find the official records of grades and communications from the division and from your school or teachers. Canvas is our digital instructional tool. So oftentimes assignments, class materials and resources will be posted there for students to access, but it's also a great resource for parents who may be helping their student as well. And then Remind is a messaging program that some of our teachers use to send out class messages and reminders to parents and students. And then finally, and I'm not an expert in this, but many home networks allow for parental controls. So you can explore what your, in particular, 
device, you, your network and router have available for parental controls for when students are allowed to access the internet. Again, this is not my area of expertise and I don't work for these companies, but I know that many provide an app that you can use to limit when certain devices on your network are available to access the internet and things of that nature. So maybe explore that with your internet provider and see what options you have. So thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you found this information to be helpful. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us and we will do our best to answer and post the answers for others to see. Thank you.